we're delighted to welcome back for a third appearance, Gavin Neat, CEO of Neatbox. Gavin, uh, we're delighted to have you back. It's always a pleasure. Um, just for those that don't know you, you, you started your life in the forces, then moved to guide dogs, uh, then decided that you wanted to become an inventor and entrepreneur and, uh, <laughs> and ended up starting, starting um, with, with a whole bunch of proximity-based applications to help your, your user base of people with disabilities. So um, most recent and most successful thing uh, has been Welcome app which I'm sure you're going to tell us about, but uh, also need to give you hearty congratulations on being nominated for the Diversity Awards in the National Diversity Awards, which you're up for, along with another couple of um, Access Chat regulars, Molly Watt and Atif Chowdhury. So um, we're really pleased and proud that we know how to pick them here. So yeah, welcome, Gavin. Good. Yeah, I think it's not so much you pick people at Access Chat, I think people gravitate towards Access Chat. So it's, it's not you picking people, I think they're gravitating towards you and that's obviously a sign of the success that you guys have. That must be my enormous mass. I have my <laughs> own gravitational force. <laughs> eating too many cakes. Um, I, I'm going to take issue with something you said a minute ago. Though. Uh, you yep. said I decided to be an inventor and entrepreneur or whatever. <laughs> 100% not an intention of mine. It was a friend of mine who saw me as a snowball at the top of a hill, kicked me, pushed me down the hill, and never got in the way to stop me from getting bigger and bigger. So it was not an intention. It was, I, I, if anybody had asked me what I was going to be doing in 10, 20 years, I'd have said, I'm going to be a guide dog mobility instructor. So I had never an intention of having a company and, and doing things that I'm doing. Uh, having looked back and having done it, I'm glad I did it because it is just so exciting I'm working with way more people and I have the opportunity to affect so positively so many more people's lives than I could have ever dreamt possible. So it's a, a happy mistake, but um, it, was, it wasn't an intention. Okay, uh, brilliant. So, so tell us how you've been getting on since we last caught up with you, which was what, what 18 months ago, probably about that? Uh, I, feel, I think it was longer than that. Um, okay. I mean, the, Maybe two years. About my connection with Access Chat is because I I join you guys as many Tuesdays as I possibly can. I don't feel like there's much for me to tell you about because I put lots of stuff out there and I certainly mm -hmm. copy you in. But um, things have moved on a long way. If anybody watches the previous video and watches this one, they're going to see a big difference. Uh, so the biggest difference, I guess, and you mentioned welcome before, uh, but it wasn't that I changed what the company was doing and uh, those are the, the you guys you can see behind me I've got a pedestrian crossing which has a red man on it um, but my initial everything I did initially was was based around this guy here and I probably showed this the last time I did access chat which was this young fella here who was pointing out to people in a picture the distance between a guide dog owner and a, and a button at a pedestrian crossing and that's where it all started and that's where I came up with button by Neatbox which was the mobile phone pressing the button at a crossing um, and then the journey from there to welcome which is welcome by Neatbox was if I can press the button at a pedestrian crossing with my mobile phone I can press the button at a door in fact a piece of hardware I'm not, I'm not going to keep it still just in case anybody copies it but the piece of hardware that I've got here um, is actually the piece of kit that was designed to be able to open doors as well. So if I can press the button at a crossing, I can press the button at a door. And if I can press the button at a door and the door opens for me as I walk towards it, well, because my phone has a specific IP address, the door knows who's opened it. And if the door knows who's opened it, the building knows that I've come into the building. And if the building knows, there's an opportunity for me to inform all of the people in the building that I want to know about my arrival. And if I can do that, I can actually preempt them as to how best they could interact with me. Now, when I was back with guide dogs, I would walk into shops and ultimately at the end of a person's training, I would be 10 or 15 foot behind the person. And then I would observe how people interacted with them as they walked into the shop. So I was in a unique position to see how society interacted with disabled people without me standing next to the disabled person. 
And what I found was the most consistent there was there was no consistency in how customer service teams interacted with my clients. And I realized at that time that that's because it's really difficult, if not impossible, to train every single staff member how to interact with every single person who comes in in a way that's pertinent to that person individually, whether they are disabled or not, but increasingly if they are disabled in a way that is going to be non-discriminatory and of course in a way that is going to remove the anxiety in not just the person who's arriving, but also the anxiety and awkwardness in the person who's greeting them. And I think Scope, well I know Scope had a campaign a couple of years ago called End the Awkward, uh, which was about the awkwardness that customer service people or people in general feel when they meet somebody who is disabled, uh, obviously disabled, but bearing in mind something that pretty much everybody in our group knows, and that is 75% of people who are disabled have hidden disabilities. And if you have a hidden disability, you're going to have to self-declare. Now, self-declaring to somebody who doesn't know how to interact with you can put that person's awkwardness in the moment. You can imagine going into Starbucks, getting into the queue, getting to the front of the queue and the person saying, hello, what's your name to write on the cup? And you say, oh, my name's Gavin. And by the way, uh, I have schizophrenia or I have epilepsy or I have autism or whatever it might be that you feel that they need to know. So nobody's going to do that for a start. But if you did do that, the person would just be like a rabbit in headlights and they wouldn't know. So that's pretty much what led me to starting Welcome, which was the ability to inform customer service teams as I walk through the door. And it's moved on a long way since then. But as I walk through the door, uh, as to my requirements and how best they interact with me. Yep. And, and I think we know from our own feedback with um, our people in our head office, our, our reception staff, they're delighted to actually do this. Uh, they're, they're really pleased to actually have the information and, and, and everything else uh, mm -hmm. and to be able to greet people in a way that's, that's effective and um, respectful um, mm -hmm. and um, reducing their anxiety about yeah. dealing with, with those individuals. So uh, one of the nicest stories, Neil, sorry to interrupt, one of the nicest yeah. stories we had was actually at your head office where um, your admin manager was using the system for the first time and uh, she got the overview that people get and they got the tip, top tips and I said, right, you're going to be meeting a chap who's going to be arriving three floors down in a couple of minutes time. Here's his name. He's a guide dog owner. I want you to put all these things into practice. And she read it and she left us and she was shaking like a leaf because she'd gone from unconscious incompetence into conscious semi incompetence because she kind of like, oh, my God, this is really nerve wracking. And she came up, she gave him, met him, put it into practice, gave him sighted guide, took him to the room where he was having a meeting, got him a cup of tea, uh, didn't talk to his guide dog, which was quite amazing when you consider, uh, came back to us. And this time she started talking again. She was shaking. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. That's my payment. I love that. Uh, and she was saying, I've never been more frightened and nervous. And yet I've never been more accelerated at actually having delivered a service. I, yeah. I every time I hear that. Yeah, it, no, and it's great. Um, although we do have to re-educate her not to talk to guide dogs. No, she <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm talking re-educating. <laughs> they need to use the system. They would remind her. I get that. No, no. Yeah, that's so important. So yeah, important. I know. It's just no. It's a temptation, isn't it? Uh, so we're all dog lovers. Yeah, go on, Antonio. I know you've got a question. So no, we have been talking about uh, in in a uh, with in the relationship that you uh, and how we can improve customer service, but we have been looking at uh, a perspective of, of um, consumer services. But I you know, but I know that it's also possible to use this for business in business to business when someone is visiting someone else's site. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, what type of work you have been doing also in that space? Yeah, so, and you make a great point there, and we added to that recently. Um, so, yes, you could be going into a shop or a train station or an airport, and there's somebody whose job it is to give better customer service. But equally, if you go into, um, I don't know, somewhere like Regis or WeWork or an office block or an, a, a building like yours, a receptionist is there. Um, and that person can be talking to a member of staff 
as much as they could be talking to a visitor to the building. And when it comes to members of staff, increasingly we need to be aware of maybe neurodiversity within our workforce. Uh, we need to be aware of hidden disability within our workforce. We need to take into consideration that person's needs. But we also need to encourage our workforce to feel that it's not a negative and it's not going to be looked at as a negative if they declare that they are living with a particular condition. Because ultimately, every day they're getting to work and they might be having friction in their working life, which causes eventual stress. And if they were able to openly say, yeah, I, I have autism or, yeah, no, I, I, I have dyslexia or whatever it might be. If they can openly say that and they know they're going to be met with somebody who goes, no problem, we're going to change the way we do things in order to accommodate that, then we have a better workforce. Uh, so we, we did that and we are now increasingly using it as a training tool within organizations so that not only do you have to be don't have to be using the system but you could also have somebody using the system the day before and it gives service to everybody so it's like a staff training tool uh, so that's really useful but um where we're having crazy success right now um banking uh banking has an entire department uh called vulnerability and they recognize that vulnerable customers uh could be people who are disabled but anybody working with money where there's mental health uh, and uh, challenges around having difficult conversations, that area can be incredibly challenging for people. So banking has been a, a massive step for us. Royal Bank of Scotland have now invited us to install across the UK. Uh, and beyond that, and this is where I got particularly excited, they asked us where we wanted it. And we asked our users, where do you want it? They all wrote to us and we gave that list to the Royal Bank of Scotland. My God, that's societal change, empowerment. The uh, definition of charity, uh, and charities do amazingly good work and have done for hundreds of years, but the definition of charity is provision of services or financial support to those in need or needy. And when we empower people, we remove the need. We remove the need for charity because the person no longer needs charity because they have the same rights and equalities as everybody else to find work, to be employed, to to do the, to have the life that they want in a way that has been uh, where the barriers have been removed. Now, when the barriers are there, of course, there's a need. Uh, and I don't want to diss this and say the end of charity because we're all always going to need it uh, and certain areas will always need it. But I think. The societal change that comes when you when you have this initial greeting of two people, meeting of two people, when you start realizing that if we change, we welcome people into the world that everybody lives in, uh, then that's that's the secret to this. And and I think that's probably the important thing about what we're doing with welcome. Fundamentally, even though it is a piece of technology, the very ethos of it is when one person meets another person and they both already know that they don't have to bang their heads together in order to find common ground. When two people meet, could meet a total stranger, but if somebody said you had a little bit of information like their name uh, and where they were from and what their passions in life were, and you met them and you'd never met them before, you go, hi, Brian, you love basketball, don't you? I love basketball. Now that moment, if you can if you can engineer that through technology, you've changed how we interact as humans. I walked onto the bus the other day and I walked up the past 10 people with staring into my phone, but knowing there was about 10 people. And I thought, if I knew every single person on this bus, I would walk past each person and go, Mike, John, Mrs. Smith, how's the kids? And by the time I got to the back of the bus, it would be a very different feeling on the bus. And I'm not saying we're doing that on buses, but if I walk into any building and the person at reception knows my name, and knows how best to interact with me, I have a very different feeling towards the world I'm living in. Uh, something that I found particularly interesting is the fact that they are rolling out that across the country and they ask you to where's the best place to add it. Because sometimes we, we see uh, one-off situations, oh, we have a, a site or a location here that is accessible, and then there's a group of people that can go to that place and then 
basically accessibility is ignored basically almost almost everywhere. So yeah. it's really interesting that because I think that uh, that states also uh, uh, an element of trust because it means uh, that they are really committed to bringing that to their customers, uh, and we don't see that that uh, uh, often, and I, I find it particularly interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, and I, you know this, you guys know this, because in the past, maybe it might have been charities who tried to lead the charge on change, societal change, but I've worked with enough big companies now to know that there are departments and people, passionate people within companies who are driving from within the company. Uh, like a massive super tanker where somebody working in a certain room is all about in improving everybody on the super tanker's health. Uh, then that's what companies are doing now. And, and I think there's a massive change. Uh, and I, I hope, uh, well, here's a great example. SSE in Perth, uh, Scottish and Southern Electric, you have to reverse your car into your car parking space because the recognition is that if you drive in straight, when you reverse out, there's an increased chance of a crash. If you go into Perth and you walk around, so many cars are now reversed into car parking spaces because a lot of the people who work there live in the town. So the accident level in Perth potentially could have gone down because of something SSE have said, and they've got like 500 cars car parked in their car park. Um, yeah. You could have changed society by doing something so simple within a large organization. So, so, that, so that's, that's a, um, what we call a positive externality. So externalities are things that, that that come outside of the. So this is this is a term for this is from economics and and also from sort of sustainability mapping. So so externalities a, a good analogy would be a, of a negative one would be pollution. So when you produce something or you take an action, there are also sort of unintended or or unaccounted for other consequences and, and, and those are cons those are called externalities so so in this particular case the 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 positive externality of their policy is that they're also reducing accidents rates in their in their lo locality uh, and I'm very interested in externalities in general um, because inaccessibility is often an externality of the production and planning process so uh, it's but it's not externalities aren't necessarily negative they're just not not figured into the uh, into the planning at the moment so it's good to measure positive ones as well as, as well as negative ones so the stuff that you're talking about is all of the sort of the positive upside externalities and we need to measure them as well as the the bad things um, so that we can we can get that kind of balance right. Uh, I'm I'm actually very keen in in applying models around externalities like we do for pollution and sustainability to looking at societal sustainability and finding ways of uh, rewarding organisations and rewarding innovation etc. So I think that you know, we we ought to be treating um, inclusion a bit like we're treating sustainability because it's societal inclusion and, and we're, we're sustaining society uh, in the same way that we're sustaining the planet um, the the analogies and, and everything else are the same what what we still need to work on are things like how do we measure this uh, what are the metrics because it's it's easy to measure something physical uh, you know so you know carbon emissions stuff like that you can you there's a way of counting that, right? Uh, it's harder to ca uh, to count inclusion, or it's harder to count exclusion because different people are going to be included or excluded in different ways. Because that's the nature of the diversity and, and disability that we we experience different exclusions and different difficulties or different strengths depending on the way that we're made up or the way that we've uh, encounter um, impairments etc it's a really interesting point we were as a small company so we don't have the ability we weren't driven by data but data like an aircraft flying across the sky is going to leave trails vapor trails yes. well we're leaving lots of vapor trails just purely by what we're doing but um, when people use our system in some of our venues so house of fraser uh, Jenner's here in Edinburgh, um, they have the system. Now, Ewan's Guide, 
which is the biggest review site in the UK. Yeah. Um, well, when you leave a review on Ewan's guide, it's created data. You've created an, uh, the, the information. So before we installed with Jenna's House of Fraser, uh, every single review on Ewan's guide was under two and a half stars. In fact, there was a couple zero. We installed, yeah. and every single review, every single review since then has been five stars in retail, which is remarkable. But the people who are using it are being, we're pushing them in a lovely way towards reviewing on Ewan's guide. So we then see the data, physical data of how different is your life after this has been put in place. Without us actually having to do anything, we just say, review it here. And people then review what they've seen with welcome. We've had amazing reviews across all of the things that we've done. So we're able to see just exactly how positive that change is for people. And with the staff, we're hearing staff members say, I now pass that on to another member of staff. Uh, so other members of staff know it, even though they don't know the system, they're still learning from them. And we hope, and this is where it becomes unrecordable, that day when they're going home and they meet somebody on the street who's visually impaired and they want to help them, they go up and say, hello, my name's Mike, can I help you across the street? Instead of, right, mate, help you across the street? So they know it was Mike. Yeah. So yeah, we're hoping that that societal change can, can happen. Excellent. So, uh, Gavin, from uh, the, from talking with uh, with people that are using the app, could be you know someone that works for a shop, for an airport. Uh, what type of uh, insights do you have in relation to how uh, the fact that they are now using this app and having this type of experience, how they are they applying this type of knowledge uh, in their in their life, even outside work, how is this changing them? So we we have we can't record that quite obviously, but um, the doorman at Jenner's, uh, sort of taking it back for a second. When I, I met a lady back in November last year at a Muscular Dystrophy UK workshop, and afterwards, after I'd done my presentation, she came up to me and she said, "This is amazing. How can I get involved?" And I said, "Well, just be yourself. If you're doing social media, talk about it. Just use it. Visit the venues and things." Well, she went out and she started up her own Facebook group um, called Welcome App Chat (WAC). Welcome App Chat, and she made it a closed group. And then people started joining the group, and people then who had joined the group would invite other people, and then they had to say where they were having issues and things like this. And um, a lot of the people who were members of the group are pan disability. So it became a group that was made up of people who were visually impaired, hearing impaired, wheelchair users, cerebral palsy, people with autism, a whole different group of people. And they were all communicating within each other. But then we started getting people who were using the app as a business joining the system. So Robin, who's a doorman at Jenner's, is now a member of the group. And he's learning about disabilities as part of this group. Also, my account manager from Scottish Enterprise is now a member of the group. His daughter has a hearing impairment, but he suddenly is now aware of wheelchair ramps and things like this. And that is what I absolutely love about it. I don't own it. It was owned by Kim. Kim started bringing people together. Society in that little microcosm of Welcome App users, which is pan disability, is not just pan disability. It's now able-bodied people or able-minded people and they are coming together and they are finding out more now if that group grows and we have more dots of these groups all over the place we have people who aren't just siloed and arguing for their situation we have people who saying well actually the ultimate is when somebody says i'm a wheelchair user but do you know what a wheel uh, i'm a visually impaired person but this wheelchair ramps rubbish god can you imagine looking down at a group of people marching along a street and not knowing what they're marching for by purely the makeup of their group. You get there and you go, wait a second, I'm seeing a wheelchair user here, I'm seeing a black person here, I'm seeing a person in a hijab, I'm seeing somebody, uh, whatever it might be, and you just think, these guys are all arguing and shouting and, and uh, advocating for a group that isn't them. That's the future, that's inclusivity, I guess, that's equality, that's where we're all, as humans, all arguing for other humans to have a better share of the world, because they're doing the same for us. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's it's great to, and I've been watching what Kim's been doing, because obviously she's a fantastic advocate for um, your product and, and the benefits that it's brought to her. I think that the, the, 
the companies that have implemented what you've done are also benefiting because she's, you know, RBS are getting loads of free publicity out of Kim uh, as she keeps going to visit the bank. So uh, yeah, yeah. We, all our users, and we have we have quite a few yeah. users, about 2,000 downloads now, and Kim yeah. loves it. Yes. Too, if Kim wants to go out and tell people that she loves it, and it's free, so why yeah. the hell not? So, no, no, it's, I, no, I think it's fantastic. And I, and I think that, you know, that kind of user advocacy is very, very powerful. Um, the fact that you've also yeah. got this, this group of, of people that are um, giving you that, that precious user feedback is, is also uh, really um, valuable for you. And, and the fact that it is pan disability as well helps your, your development and your inclusivity um beyond the um taking the, the you know the advice from the different um disability persons organizations although we we involve them as well because oh no no i know you, i know you do because you were already doing that but it's just adding an extra layer of um yeah, yeah, yeah. you know of feedback into it together. we should all be together in, in what we deliver uh and my company is not a charity my no. company is not it's a plc but it's a profit for purpose and with that becomes the ability to make money out of the businesses. Businesses make money out of using our service. People who get it for free get to go places and we get to grow the company. And the company then gets to deliver more services to more people. So profit for purpose is difficult to get your head around to start with, but ultimately the future has to be that because it's positive capitalism, because it's changing the plan positively whilst making sure that everybody can have a living out of doing it. Yeah, and, and I, I'm, I'm also very keen on, on sort of actually pro profit is, profit in itself is not evil. Uh, profiting from providing a good quality service to, to disabled customers is, is perfectly legitimate. And, and, and actually it's the way to be sustainable because the charitable model isn't sustainable. Uh, because because that is always reliant on someone else. It's always reliant on on goodwill that could dry up at any point. Whereas if you have a business, you you control your own direction. Uh, you can con you know to a certain extent you can go out there and grow. But the charity thing's a challenge as well, Neil, because yep. you don't know where that money's coming from. Yes, you do if it's large amounts of money, but somebody could put in ten thousand pounds into a charity. Well, we don't know how that charity, that money was made. There's a bit of a challenge there. We can't just say, we can't say everything about charity is golden and halo and angels. No. Because it doesn't necessarily mean it's that. Profit no. purpose, at least you are saying everybody is winning out of this. And when you say purpose or profit, uh, or being a profit making company, uh, we're a SaaS model company, which software as a service, yeah. we make tiny, tiny fractions of money. We have to be everywhere for us to actually make anything out of it. And my goal has never been making money; otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. No, 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 no. Of course, but but I mean, it's 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 not about you know enormous riches or the neat box yacht, which I keep teasing you about. But um, <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day, you're going to take me sailing. It's yeah. like NASA. It's not like NASA. Siabi has a powerboat, right? Uh, right, yeah. Yeah, he's got a powerboat. So, um, yeah, but at the same time, and thank you, Mike Blink. We know, we, you know, you've used your profit for good purpose. You keep us going as well. Um, but, but it's okay. You know what? It's, it's you know, you're helping you know, thousands of people. It's, it's all right to make an honest living out of that. You know, it's better than you know, burning the rainforest or you know, there's so many things that that make lots of money that don't do good. Why is it that, that doing good shouldn't make money? Let's, it's worth let's doing. put it. You know, what, what, what is it about doing good things that you can't make money from them? Why is it that you can only make money from doing bad? Yeah, well, it, it, I, I, it I, I, and, and, in, and in fact, Gavin, you, you are actually connecting big people that want to do business together, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm making I made less money doing this than I did when I was a guide dog mobility instructor. Okay. Well, yeah, we'd like that to change, and, well, and hopefully over time it will. Is different. The mental attitude. I was working for a charity, therefore it was okay. Whereas now it's like it's not okay because I'm. I don't know. It's a difficult. It's an interesting one, and I think we need to get our heads round it if we want to be sustainable in the future. 
uh, to actually have something that grows that is sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that, that, yes, we do need to re-examine our kind of models of of how we uh, finance disability inclusion and, and stuff like that. And I think that, that, that large businesses and large organizations are recognizing the value in, in this, but small organizations also, you know, and startups have a, you know, a significant role to play, as they do in every part of business life. Because actually, it's SMEs make up a huge, and micro businesses make up a huge part of our economy. We always look to the large businesses and think that they're what drives our economy. And that's actually not the case. You know, they're, they're visible because they're ubiquitous, but actually, it's the it's the small businesses that are, are the core of our economies around the world. And 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 helping them finding ways to be inclusive as well, where they don't have the same kind of resources is also something that I think is important that we need to do. Well, what we've done is we have a different um, uh, payment model. So large, like an airport would be, or a stadium, like Wembley Stadium might be seen as being the highest because well, Edinburgh Airport alone has 88,000 people um, who are using special assistance. I think Heathrow has 1.5 million a year going through it. Those are the ones who say that they are disabled. Um, and then we have a smaller model, which might be uh, banks. And then a smaller model again, which will be an SME, which will be an independent coffee shop. And they might only pay 10 pounds a month uh, in order to have this system in place. A bank might pay 50 pounds a month. But then below that, we then have charities. And charities can get it for free or a nominal fee just for the, for the contract. So that the charity is then able to do service to people who come through the door as well. Uh, so we have different scales of this based on the numbers of people who are necessarily going through the door, and we don't want a little coffee shop not to be able to use our system. No, but but you somehow uh, uh, being a SaaS, but you there are there are solutions that we name as CRM solutions that somehow do what you do. You just do it physically. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think is particularly interesting to look at the model of a CRM software, customer relationship management software, and see how you, uh, within the inbox, relate into that because you actually are somehow aligned in some of the objectives about what the CRM is about. Well, it's obviously incredibly important to ensure that whatever you do builds a company, but also makes sure that everybody who uses it understands what they're buying into when they use it. I guess, yeah. I think probably the, yeah, that's probably the best way to put that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think that um, the analogy is a really good one, you know, because it is, it's customer relationship management in, 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 in the physical world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, we, we we are not doing the at the moment at least not applying the same kind of level of uh, granularity about understanding our physical customers. I think that's changing, um, and some of it there's a bit of a backlash against because we're seeing things like facial recognition being used in public spaces and and so on, where organisations are trying to get a handle on. Uh, who's coming through, who, who's shopping with them, who's using their services, etc. I think the difference is between what you're doing with Neatbox and what some of the stuff that is happening with some of the AI-driven camera tech is that this is voluntary and it's, it's the user is choosing to give their data. Uh, and that's very much a different model from the sort of data harvest, the mass data harvesting that is going on right now, um, often without people's knowledge. Yeah, well, anybody using our system gets it for free. Uh, when they sign up for it, they don't put in their address. They don't put in the credit card details. They put in their name, but they could put in Mickey Mouse if they wanted. Uh, and they put in a photograph just so they can be recognized when they walk through the door. And the message they could put in could be, I don't want any help today, please ignore me because a lot of disabled people actually get overhelped uh, or patronized or whatever it might be. So it's, I don't, want to, I don't want to be part of the system, but ignore me. So as soon as you see me, ignore me. But if, even if you don't want to use the system at all, 
if somebody else has used it, you will get better service because of it. You're going to get better service because two days before, a blind chap came in uh, and um, used the system and the customer representative said, I know I shouldn't touch the dog, or I know I need to introduce myself, or I know I need yeah. to have water available. So you don't even have to use the system to get better customer service, just like when you do staff training, you're not doing it for the individual, you're doing it for anybody you might encounter. So I totally understand that people are worried about data, but a lot of the people who started those companies and those organizations and those initiatives were looking for data first and then found a way to use the data to help people, whereas we're looking to help people and therefore don't really care about the data, although know that other people do. Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, they have a solution looking for a problem. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and and really, you, you've created a solution based upon the fact that you were aware of a problem. And I think that that's, that's, that's what's rich about about this and that's what's rich about a lot of the stuff with assistive tech is that it is born out of pragmatically solving problems that people face in their day-to-day -day lives and that, that we do that for the problems that come out of impairment but those solutions inevitably end up making other people's lives more beneficial, easier, etc. So, well, that, um, yeah. With the, with the button app. Um, yeah. and I turn it on and show you that's it found the crossing behind us and if yes. I press that this is because I realized that people couldn't press buttons at pedestrian crossings and you'll see a green light come on in the background there with a red light and then, right, we'll light. and then the green man will come on and that's because I recognized that people couldn't press the button at pedestrian crossings so yes. I was like I wonder if rather than how can I how can I make money or how can I where's what needs fixed no, yes. I recognise this. That was my user experience for 18 years. Yes. No, I think that I think that's brilliant, and and it's why, you know, we. I think you've got a a solid following. I think there's there's so much more that could be built on top of it, on top of your core. You know, obviously your core purpose, but but there's definitely a you know another layer that, that, all that people messaging. will buy into. We've got messaging systems in here, yeah, yeah. we're putting it on buses, we're putting with LNER, we're putting it with yeah. first bus, it's going into like banks and airports, Northlink ferries now have it in all their ferry terminals, so yeah. transport is, yeah, we're, we're certainly finding there is so much more we can do. Yeah, and I, and I, I think, you know, you're, you know, one of the good practical examples of how we can make smart cities more inclusive. You know, it's through location awareness, through uh, remote access to the products and facilities and infrastructure. You know, this is a manifestation of that. So, um, you know, it's why I'm such a big fan of, of what you're doing. I think we are pretty close to the end of our half hour. It's gone fast as usual, so I need to thank NASA and the crew from Microlink again, Barclays Access again, you know, for for keeping us going for all of this time, sustaining us over five years. Of course, my clear text, Elaine sitting in the background, give us a wave, Elaine, um, um, for, for making sure that we're captioned and inclusive. So thank you very much. Looking forward to you, know, you joining us for a great discussion on Twitter on Tuesday. It is beyond a pleasure. I, I feel this is family, and I love talking to you guys. And thank you so much for having me on again. Okay. Thank you, Gavin.